All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the latest set of RBT exam practice questions. We'll go through this set of questions together and break each question down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and practice exams. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Question one, a behavior analyst instructs their behavior technician to use partial interval recording to measure how often a client attempts to take off their shoes. Each interval is set at 10 seconds and the entire sample of time is 10 minutes. At what point will the technician record a response? Now, what is the question asking about specifically? They're asking about when is the technician going to record a response using partial interval recording or partial interval measurement. So start first with what is par partial interval recording. That's when we have a sample of time, we break it into intervals, and then in each interval, we're looking to see if the behavior occurs or if it doesn't occur. And remember, with partial interval recording, as long as the behavior occurs at all, so even for one second, it counts as a response. So since we know our intervals are set at 10 seconds and we have a sample time of 10 minutes, that's what we're going to be working within. So if you're the technician in this case and your intervals are set at 10 seconds, when does the response need to occur for you to record a response? Well, at any point during those 10 seconds. It doesn't have to occur the whole time. It doesn't have to occur half the time. As long as the response occurs in a partial interval recording system, you count it as a response. So to answer the question, at what point will the technician record a response? Well, it's going to be at any point when the response occurs within those 10 seconds. So if we look at A, whenever the response occurs during the 10 seconds, that looks like what we're talking about, but can you be even more specific? Because remember, with interval recording, you're only recording one response for each interval, no matter how many times it happens. So yes, you're going to record a response if it occurs during the 10 seconds, but can you get more specific? So B, if the response occurs during the entire 10 seconds, well, B would be whole interval recording, which isn't what we're looking for. C, if the response occurs at all during the 10 minutes, well, the 10 minutes is our sample of time. We're thinking and looking at specifically intervals here. And so D, whenever the response occurs during the 10 seconds, yes, once per interval max, yes. D is more specific than A. It's a better answer. Yes, we're going to record a response if it occurs during 10 seconds, but we're only recording one response max, even if that response occurs 20 times. We're still only going to count one of those. So your data is going to indicate one response per interval. So at what point will you record a response? Whenever the response occurs during the 10 seconds, once per interval max. Remember, we need to read all of our answer choices, pick the best answer, and understand why the wrong answers are wrong. Shauna bites her nails when she is stressed. She wants to do something about this behavior because she will ruin her nails after she gets them done. She starts taking data and finds out she bites her nails on average 14 times per hour. What would be a response in this scenario? Now think about this question very carefully and remember, we want to be sure we know what the question is asking. The question is asking about what is a response in this scenario? Because we have a few different things happening here, right? We, we know she's biting her nails because she's stressed and she wants to change her behavior because she ruins her nails. So she takes data and, and she gets a rate. She finds the measurement 14 pounds per hour, which is great. What the question is asking about is what qualifies as a response. And remember, a behavior is the overall picture of what is occurring, right? And so biting nails is the behavior. A response is each individual instance of the behavior. And now while that seems a little specific, it's important to know the difference because when you're measuring, you're measuring the behavior, but what you're really measuring is each individual response. So in this case, if the behavior is biting nails, what is going to be each, what is going to be a response in this scenario? A, each time Shauna bites her nails. Yes, each instance of the behavior is a response. So you have the behavior, which is your overall picture, your overall target, and then each time the behavior occurs, that's a response. 
What about B, the target of nail biting? Well, nail biting is the overall behavior. So again, response is each time the behavior occurs. 14 times per hour is the rate, so that's going to be Shauna's measurement. And then Shauna being stressed, well, that's just a setting event, more or less. That's not the actual response. The response in this scenario is each time Shauna bites her nails, because a response is each individual instance of the behavior. Landon is considered a smart boy and a quick learner. He typically picks up things quickly during discrete trial training. Today, his reinforcement schedule went from a FR3 to a VI5. Now, Landon is much slower at responding and has shown signs of escape. What is the likely explanation? So let's think about this. We're looking at Landon, who is by the question's description, smart and a quick learner. He picks up things quickly during DTT. Great. Now, his reinforcement schedule has changed. It's gone from a fixed ratio of three to a variable interval five. So they've started to fade out reinforcement. What is an FR3? Fixed ratio three, meaning previously every three correct responses landed would get reinforcement. What's the new schedule? Well, a VI5, a variable interval five. So now, on average, every five minutes, Landon gets reinforced. That's a giant change. You're going from every three responses to, on average, every five minutes. Huge leap in the amount of reinforcement delivered and when reinforcement is delivered. And so, as a result, Landon is responding slower and he's showing signs of escape. His behavior is changing. He's not responding as rapidly. New behaviors, new maladaptive behaviors are emerging. What likely occurred? Well, based on the scenario, all we know is they changed his reinforcement schedule. They faded it. And when you fade a reinforcement schedule too quickly, sometimes responding goes down and maladaptive behaviors begin to occur. What do we call that? A, escape was reinforced. Well, there's no indication that escape was reinforced from the question. Remember, you're never assuming anything and you're never adding anything. You've got to use only the information provided to you in the question. So we can't say escape was reinforced. We're not sure of that. B, Landon is experiencing ratio strain. B is very likely. Ratio strain occurs when you fade reinforcement too quickly. You've increased the effort to gain reinforcement so dramatically that Landon is now not responding nearly as much as he was. And now he's trying to get out of work rather than engaging in work. So ratio strain is very likely. C, an extinction burst is occurring. But well, we're not putting Landon beha Landon's behavior on extinction. We're still reinforcing it, just at a much, much lower and slower rate, which can be a problem. D, Landon needs the premac principle. Premac principle might be effective, but do we necessarily need it? Well, no, because previously, Landon was a smart boy, a quick learner who was doing great. The issue seems to be we faded reinforcement too quickly. He was used to getting reinforcement very quickly rapidly, right? Every three answers, I get reinforced. Now I've got to wait on average five minutes for one time for one reinforcement. That's a big, big jump. So what likely happened is reinforcement was faded too quickly and Landon is now experiencing ratio strain. Jonah is preparing for a dissertation proposal by rehearsing his presentation with his girlfriend. His girlfriend is grading him and giving him feedback each time he presents to her. Jonah feels ready, but what will be most important in order for Jonah to have a successful proposal? So, we want Jonah to be successful. He says he's ready, but something needs to occur in order for him to have a successful proposal. So, what do we know about the current situation? Well, he's preparing for proposal with his girlfriend. So, he's with his girlfriend. He's practicing. He's practicing. She's grading him, giving him feedback. Now, Jonah being able to do the proposal successfully with his girlfriend is important because that's good practice, right? He's getting better at it. But does it really matter if he can do it with his girlfriend? Can he, if he can do the proposal with his girlfriend? Not necessarily. And and why? Well, because she's not the one ultimately deciding if he's successful or not on the proposal. He's just practicing with her. So what's going to make Jonah actually successful? What's most important? in terms of Jonah's success. A, maintenance of the presentation. 
So think about this. Maintenance is what? Well, maintenance is when the behavior continues or you're still able to, to do the behavior even when teaching stops. And as of now, Joan has only done the behavior with his girlfriend in this setting. So even if he maintains the presentation ability, he's only ever done it in this setting. So it really still doesn't mean anything. What does Jonah need to do? Well, Jonah needs to generalize. That's going to be the most important thing. It doesn't matter if Jonah can maintain. He needs to generalize. He needs to be able to generalize the dissertation proposal in front of the people who matter and in the setting that matters. That's going to be the difference between Jonah being successful and not. See positive feedback during the presentation. Well, that's not going to be the most important thing. Who knows what kind of feedback he's going to get. Regardless of that feedback, he needs to be able to generalize what he's been practicing with his girlfriend to the actual proposal setting in front of the actual proposal people. And then D, punishment when he does something wrong. Punishment is, is certainly not going to be the most important thing for Jonah to be successful. His girlfriend is trying to give him feedback. He's, she's trying to pump him up, trying to make him better at the proposal. But it's not going to matter unless he can actually go and generalize. Remember, generalization is arguably the most important thing in our job. If our clients aren't generalizing, we're not actually being successful. Generalization is, is everything. We need Jonah to be able to take what he's done and practiced and go translate it to the real world. Meg loves to dance, but her parents do not approve. Whenever Meg dances in front of her parents, they reprimand her and ground her for the weekend. Now, Meg only dances in private or when her parents are not around. What do Meg's parents represent relative to dancing? So let's think about this, right? We've got the question asking specifically about Meg's parents in relation to dancing. So we need to find that relationship between Meg's parents and dancing. We know Meg loves to dance. We know her parents do not approve. When Meg dances in front of her parents, what do they do? Well, they reprimand her and ground her. So they're, they're, they're attempting to punish her. And it seems to be successful because Meg only dances in private now. So not when her parents are around. And why is that? Well, in the past, Meg knows if I dance in front of my parents, they're going to punish me. Meg's parents are signaling to Meg, dancing in front of us is going to lead to punishment. So what do Meg's parents represent? A, an SD for reinforcement. Well, they're not signaling reinforcements available. If they signaled reinforcement is available, then Meg's behavior would increase in front of them. What they've done is they've created themselves, or they've, they've caused themselves to become SDs for punishment relative to dancing. Meg knows if I dance in front of my parents, punishment is now available. Remember, the SD, the discriminative stimuli, signals a consequence is available. And so Meg's parents signal it, or, or signaling that punishment is available if you dance in front of us. See, a prompt, they're not a prompt, they're not prompting her to do, any, do anything. They're just signaling to her, if you dance, we will punish you. D, none of the above. Well, obviously it's not none of the above. B is going to be our best answer. So you need to understand what an SD is, right? A discriminative stimuli. It's our antecedent, it evokes behavior, and it signals consequences are available. And then you need to understand consequences can be reinforcement or punishment. So SDs can signal reinforcement or punishment depending on the scenario and the learning history. Meg has learned her parents will punish her if she dances, so they become SDs for punishment. Which of the following is not true about momentary time sampling measurement? All right, we have a not true question, meaning three of these are true. And we're looking at momentary time sampling. What is momentary time sampling? It's when we record responses when they occur at the end of an interval. So it's a time sampling measurement. We're using intervals. If we have 15 second intervals, we're looking to see if the behavior occurs at the end of 15 seconds. So we're looking for something that is not true about that time sampling measurement. A, there is a chance that occurrences of the behavior will be underestimated. Well, there is a chance, right? Because we're only taking a small sample of the behavior and we're taking it at a very specific time. So there's a good chance we miss some behaviors. So we might underestimate occurrences. What about B, there is a chance that occurrences of the behavior will be overestimated. Well, that's true too. If it happens that the behavior just 
seems to occur at the end of each interval, because some kids will actually pick up on that and will do it on purpose, we might overestimate how often that behavior is occurring. So momentary time sampling can underestimate or it can overestimate depending on when the behavior occurs. So both of those are true. What about C? It is always more accurate than interval recording. Well, that's not true at all, right? This word always is very strong. And momentary time sampling can't always be more accurate than interval recording because both are really dependent on the sample of time, when the behavior occurs during that sample of time. So to say it's always more accurate is just not true. What about D though? Continuous measurement is typically more accurate than time sampling. Well, that is true. Continuous measurement is almost always more accurate than intervals or time samplings because with continuous measurement, we're taking a full sample of behavior. We're continuously measuring every instance that it occurs. It's just almost always going to be more accurate than our discontinuous measurement procedures. So what is not true? We'll see. It is always more accurate than interval recording. It really just depends on the behavior, how long the intervals are, and the sample of time. James got stood up again by Lisa, even though Lisa knew they had plans tonight. This is the third time Lisa has forgotten about their plans, yet James keeps texting her back. Assuming that Lisa standing James up qualifies as punishment, what possible reasons are there for why James keeps texting her? So let's not overthink this, right? What is the question asking about? Well, they're saying that Lisa standing James up is punishment. And so we're not going to question that. The, the question is saying Lisa standing James up, Lisa forgetting about their plans, qualifies as punishment. So we know that. But James keeps texting her. And the question is asking why. If James is being punished, why does he keep texting her? A, punishment is not permanent. Sure, right? Punishment, that is a very true true statement. Punishment is not permanent. So let's say James's behavior is punished, and so for three weeks he doesn't text her, and on the fourth week he texts her back because punishment has stopped, and when punishment stops, behavior tends to return. B, no replacement behavior was taught. Absolutely. Punishment works until it stops. When it stops, they still need a, new, they still need a behavior to meet that function. And if you didn't teach a replacement, they're likely to go back to the old behavior. So B is likely as well. C, something is reinforcing James when he texts Lisa. Absolutely. If James' behavior is maintaining or increasing, there's a good chance that texting Lisa is reinforcing to James. So even though forgetting about their plans is punishing James in some way, he's also possibly being reinforced when he texts Lisa. So this is more of a generalized or general question about what makes punishment effective and what doesn't make punishment effective. So the possible reasons are all three. Punishment's not permanent, no replacement behavior was taught, and there's likely something is reinforcing James when he texts Lisa. So what are the possible, keyword, possible reasons? Well, all of the above are possible. All right, thank you for watching. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials and our combo pack. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.